Well, I am particularly full uh, this morning, not because I had a big breakfast, but I'm particularly full this morning because we're culminating um, this series on surrender. Um, and surrender has played a tremendous uh, role in my life, and I, I, I want to share a little bit of that uh, with you this morning, but I also want to set the tone from our scripture found in Matthew chapter 16. Um, just before Jesus is speaking with the disciples, preparing them for his departure, he takes them to the hardest place in that particular geographical area that they had ever been to before. And at the top of this place um, is referred to as the circle of heathens because at the top of this place um, was a, a bunch of um, uh, idols made out of stone uh, to false gods. And he takes them there, and particularly he takes Peter there, and he asks the question, who do people say that I am, right? And then uh, somebody says, so, well, some say this, some say that. And then he says, well, Peter, who do you say? What do you say? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says to him, well, you've spoken well. And flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. And then Jesus begins, he, he, he says, he figures that, well, okay, now, now that Peter has this information and he's answered correctly, now I'm about to take him to this next level. All of us are being taken to a next level throughout our lives. Our lives are filled with next level um, experiences, transitions um, in our lives, and all of our lives are filled um, with purpose. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to use as a sermon from which to preach, losing life, gaining purpose. Losing life, gaining purpose. Jesus tells the disciples and he prepares them and he says, hey, listen, I have to, uh, I have to go and uh, I am going to be taken by the chief priest and, and so forth and so on and they're going to kill me, but I'll be raised on the second, I mean, on the third day. Um, and then uh, Peter, the person that had just answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, to the question, who the people say that I am? Then Peter comes and says, come here, let me take you aside because you really don't understand. You can't, you can't go anywhere right now. That's, what are you doing? That's, what are you talking about? You can't go anywhere, you can't leave us. All of these miracles that you've already performed, how are you gonna just leave us and just, like, just leave us? How are you gonna do that, right? And then Jesus responds, Get behind me, Satan, because you're looking at the earthly things, but not at the divine things. Get behind me, Satan. You're looking at the earthly things, but not at the divine things. You see, there's a divine, holy calling purpose on the inside of each and every one of us, just as it was for Jesus. That holy calling is urging us and prompting us all throughout our life. And we will never rest until we get to experience what that holy calling is on the inside of us. Now, it may not be what we went to school for. It may not be what we uh, are doing right now. It may not be anything that we've ever even thought about. As a matter of fact, a lot of us have had very and are having very successful lives, successful careers, success in business, um, success in our families, so forth and so on. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes knocking and says, okay, that's, that's, that's cute, that's been good. But now, I'm asking you to do something different. And see, this was my experience. This was my experience as a young 27-year-old network cameraman for CBS News, flying all around the country, literally, and all around the world, shooting news stories, making a ton of money, um, doing just, just some really, really, really good work. At the time that Jesus came knocking on my door, I had already had three Emmys under my belt that I had won for television photojournalism. 
Um, people were asking me and telling me, man, you need to go to California because you need to be shooting movies. Um, you need to be in cinematography and so forth and so on. Um, I had anchors at CBS. I worked with just about everyone. I worked with uh, Bob Simon. I worked for Bob Simon with 60 Minutes. Um, uh, uh, Dan Rather at, uh, at, at CBS. Um, Charles Carrot, I was doing on uh, uh, Sunday morning with Charles Carrot, on the road with Charles Carrot, um, American Moments with Charles Carrot. Um, highly sought after, just, just, I mean, just carte blanche, just doing, doing the whole thing, right? And then all of a sudden in 1990, I get assigned to this story, and they say, Randall, we want you to go and cover um, the release of Nelson Mandela from South African prison, right? And I was like excited on one hand, but on the other hand, I wasn't so excited. And the reason why I wasn't so excited on the other hand is because at that particular time, I had this huge, 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 and some of you have heard this story before, rock of bigotry in my heart towards anyone that didn't look like me because of the stories that I had heard in my family and things that had happened um, in my family. And the only thing that was going for me was this gift that I had for photography. And if you respected the gift, then I would respect you. And that's why I didn't have any issues with any of the anchors that I was working with and so forth and so on. But it came a point where if I had done this story, I really had to think about my behavior. I really had to think about how I would approach uh, this particular story because at the time that they wanted me to cover this story, apartheid was in full effect in South Africa. And so if I had gone to South Africa with the tongue, with the attitude, and with everything that I was here, over there, it wasn't promised that I was going to return, right? As a matter of fact, the depth of my bigotry was so detrimental that when, my, when I told my mother uh, that they had asked me to go and cover this story in South Africa, she immediately began to cry and began to weep because she didn't think that I would return because I had this flippant mouth and I was just a mess, literally. But I go to South Africa and I experience this catalytic moment. And as I experience this catalytic moment, I recognize that this man, meaning Nelson Mandela, has come out of prison after 27 years, hand in hand, with some of the same people that put him in prison. And I stepped away from the camera and I said, God, what are you doing? Because my intention and my thought process at that particular time was that all of us, meaning the black people, could pick up machine guns and just mow down all of the white people and then take over South Africa. That was my thought process at the time. And when he came out and did something totally different, I was mesmerized. It was my catalytic moment. It was the moment that began to change things in my life. That was 1990. By 1992, I had, when I came back from that story, I began to go back to church. I began to really be concerned about my spiritual life, about my moral life, all of those different things. And then in 1992, I was in prayer one morning and I literally clearly heard the, uh, heard the Holy Spirit say, okay, I don't want you to begin 1993 at CBS. I don't want you to begin 1993 at CBS. And here's where my story begins to align with the biblical story. Because when I told my parents, when I told people at CBS, when I told my friends that I was going to be leaving this job that people would kill and die for, people thought that I was literally crazy. People thought the people closest to me, Peter, the people closest to me thought that I was literally crazy. What are you doing? Do you know how hard it is to get a job like this? Why would you leave a job like this that can set you up and set your family up for years? What in the world are you doing? My father was so concerned that he went and met with my pastor at that particular time and he thought that I was part of some kind of cult. <laughs> and he wanted to make sure that my pastor wasn't leading me into some, you know, no, some, some craziness, right? But it was really God that was leading me and I knew that it was God that was leading me because I felt that it was a divine and I knew that it was a divine call and not something that was just a earthly um, experience. And so I said yes to the call and that's the first nugget that I wanna bring out. When God is ushering you or God is prompting you to surrender, to get you from one place to another, the first part of that process is just the yes. It's just just saying yes and being willing to trust God 
regardless to what it looks like. Being willing to trust him regardless to what it look, looks like. Now, why is this important to us? It's important to us because we've been in this series on surrender for the last few weeks, right? And as we have been praying for you, meaning the staff, as we've been praying for you, we've been praying over those uh, prayer requests that you all uh, wrote out and, and, and submitted the, uh, about a few weeks back. We've been praying over those. And as we've been praying over those, the Holy Spirit has revealed to us that there are a number of people that have already surrendered. There are a number of people in the, in the uh, uh, congregation that God is prompting to surrender. And there are a number of people in the congregation that are still battling with whether or not they will surrender. And God, for, at such a time as this, is calling us to step out on the water. He's calling us to trust him with everything that we have and to come to this place that God is trying to get us to come to. The first part of that is just saying yes. The first part is just saying yes. When I said yes, let me tell you what began to happen. I told CBS and CBS began, they immediately asked me, they said, well, listen, can you become an independent contractor for us? And you can just still do stories if you want to do them in the Midwest or if you want to do them wherever, if you can just become an independent contractor for us. And I said, oh, sure, no problem. By the time that I left, I had independent contracts with CBS, with Entertainment Tonight, with Bill Curtis and Investigative Reports and New Explorers, and also um, um, the guy that I mentioned earlier, Charles Corrault, um, doing American Moments with Charles Corrault, right? Making even more money than I was making at CBS, just by saying yes, okay? And so the first part is saying yes. The second part is we've got to lose this previous identity. We've got to lose the previous identity. I would refer to everyone. When I meet someone or when I talk to someone and I introduce myself, I would, my introduction would be Randall Blakey, CBS News. CBS News, Randall Blakey, CBS News, right? I had to lose that identity, right? Because CBS News didn't create me, right? The person that created me was the person that I'm now working for and working on behalf of. So I had to lose that identity. I had to recognize, as the song said, that I am God's and God is mine, right? And so if God is prompting you in this particular direction, you've got to lose the identity that you have been identified by for such a time as this or up until this particular moment. You've got to be willing to lose whatever that identity is. You've got to be willing to lose it because God only takes us from something to take us to something. He's not asking us from to take us. He's not asking us to go from something, not to bring us to something. So he's always trying to get us to another place. OK. And so when I did that, I said, look, I have to lose this, uh, 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 lose this identity um, and I have to begin to just introduce myself as who I am, living out of the truth that I know. Living out of the truth that I know. That's another nugget because you have to grow to the place of understanding that you don't have to explain everything to everyone when you know the truth. When you know the truth, people didn't understand anything that I was doing. People didn't understand why I was doing it and that sort of thing. And it wasn't for me to have to explain to everyone. Sometimes in life, only three people are going to know the truth. You, the person that you're dealing with, and God. And you've got to be comfortable and confident enough to live out of the truth that you know. That piece of wisdom has helped me throughout my career in ministry throughout my career in ministry. I can tell you countless stories about how that piece of wisdom has helped me tremendously throughout my career in ministry. There's one time in particular where I walked out in a Sunday morning service, not here, but at a, at a different church. I walked out at a Sunday morning service and when I walked out, man, it was like arrows were going through me based on the people that were looking at me because there was a level of deception that was filtering through the church and people felt that I had done something that I had not done, right? And it worried me, I mean, to the point where my stomach was just hurting. 
My stomach was hurting, I was concerned about it. I was going in and out of these sweats and so forth and so on. And I petitioned God and I said, God, what is going on? I, you know I didn't do this stuff. What, what, you know, what's, what's going on? And that's when I learned, son, you've got to learn how to live out of the truth that you know. So even if Mary doesn't know the truth and Mary thinks the worst, I've got to be just as comfortable as if she knew the truth. And the goal is not to run to Mary and say, Mary, no, let me tell you what really happened. Because this didn't happen, let me tell you what really happened. So that Mary can like me, right? Right, we love each other because we're brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm not concerned about being liked, I'm concerned about being loved, amen? And so if you're concerned about being loved, you can learn how to live out of the truth that you know, where you don't have to run to anyone to tell them anything about what has happened or what did not happen. All you have to do is be confident in the fact that, you're, that God has the, has the responsibility to preserve your integrity. He has the responsibility to preserve your integrity. Now the final piece, is that we have to be willing to endure the hardness. We have to be willing to endure the hardness, and that's where it gets pretty difficult. Jesus, who went all the way to the cross, despising its shame for you and I, for the joy that was set before him. So what am I talking about? How, what, what, what am I saying here? Well, what I'm saying here is it's going to get difficult when you surrender. It's going to get difficult, but you will not be alone. That's the key. You will not be alone. There are countless stories, countless stories that I can give you about how God has met me where I was at how he helped me to overcome my fear with whatever I was dealing with because of God's love for me. All of this, when God is prompting us to move to a different place, when God is prompting us in an area of transition, all of it is due to God's love for us. It's God's love for us to take us and to get us to a a, a better place. But not only that, it's so that we can know God better. And know without a, doubt that, without a doubt that God has us and will never release his hold from us. Never, ever, ever. I think I told you the story once before about the morning that I was in prayer and the Lord said, okay, I don't ever want you to work for MCI again. MCI at that particular time was one of my largest corporate clients. And he says, I don't want you to do any more. After today, I don't want you to do any more work for MCI. And he said, after you do this shoot, he said, I don't even want you to apologize to them, but I do want you to tell them that today will be the last day that you'll be doing any work for them. Now that's that's, that's some hard stuff. That's some hard stuff when you're in business in a secular setting, right? And you're looking at things through a divine lens and you know that the secular setting folks are not gonna understand at all what you're talking about or what you're doing. It's a difficult place, but not only is it a difficult place, it was also the largest corporate client that I had at that time, paying the most money. But I knew that I had to do what God was telling me to do. Because over that course of time, I understood through experience how to be obedient to God when God was leading me to surrender. And so after that shoot, I said to uh, Scoville, I said, hey Scoville, I I wanna thank you for everything that you all have uh, have done for my company and so forth and so on, but today is the last day I'm gonna be able to do any work for you all. I'll send the last invoice and that'll be it. And of course he just went ballistic. Do you know, do you know, you know, just, just went just crazy, right? How could you do this? We worked so hard to get you in here, just so forth and so on, right? He went through all of that, and I couldn't apologize. I had to say, thank you very much. I sent the sound guy down to go get the car, and I was getting the rest of my gear, 
And as I was on my way out of the building, we were over here at the Cadillac Theater. It wasn't called the Cadillac at that time, but we were over at the Cadillac Theater. And I was coming down the stairs. And as I was coming down the stairs, one of the managers that I had favor with was coming up the stairs. And he said, okay, Randall, you out of here? I'll, I'll talk to you later. I said, yeah, man, I'll see you later. And he didn't know the conversation that I just had with Scoville. And he said, uh, well, I guess you've heard the scuttlebutt. And I said, no, what, what, what are you talking about? And he says, they're going to be closing this Chicago Center down on Monday. And all those people up there right now, all of them are getting pink slips. And almost tears start to come down my eyes because God would not allow me to be part of their deception. And on Monday morning, just as the manager stated, the Chicago office at MCI closed, all of those people that they had just, what they wanted them to do, that they wanted to excite them to get them to make their numbers through the weekend so that on Monday they would shut down the thing and they would have still made their numbers for the month. They brought in Les Brown to speak to the, to, to, uh, uh, to the Chicago office. But he would not allow me to be a part of that. On Thursday of that next week, that was on a Friday, on Thursday of that next week, I got a call from Coca-Cola Bottling here in Chicago to do 60 spots. They called me to do 60 spots, which tripled the amount that I was making with MCI. You see, it's the willingness and the obedience to say yes and to be willing to endure. Be willing to endure. The last thing that I'll share with you is the, uh, the time that I was in, um, uh, uh, in business and uh, we had a shoot to do um, at the Daily Center. And we were doing this shoot for, um, it wasn't Entertainment Tonight, I, I can't re remember the, the um, um, the show right now. It may have been Access, Access Hollywood or something like that. But anyway, we were doing this story and they wanted to interview um, lawyers at the Daily Center and in and around uh, the Loop area. The challenge was that particular morning, I only had $5 in my pocket and the account was empty because we were waiting on accounts receivable to come in and accounts, accounts receivable had not come in. And so I woke up with the understanding that I was gonna write a personal check from my personal account into my business account and deposit it at the cash station, totally deceiving the bank so that I can get money out of the business account and have money to matriculate downtown. That's what I woke up with. And so I got up that morning with my plan and I'm like, you know, praising and worshiping God and nothing is, I'm not feeling anything. Everything is just ice cold. And I was like, man, God, what's, what's going on? I went and sat down. And the Lord said this clearly to me. He said, sooner or later, you're going to have to allow me to be Lord over your finances. Because if you're going to get to the place where I want you to be, your God cannot be money but I have to be Lord. And I was like, but man, I gotta go downtown. I gotta, just through, we have a truck. So through the door, I'm $30 for parking. Okay, that's before I even take out the camera, right? So what are we gonna do? How's this gonna happen, right? He says, well, you can trust me or you can do your plan. And you know what? I made a decision that day to trust God. I began to trust God and I began to pray all the way in the car. I was praying and so forth and so on. And I was just building my faith and encouraging uh, myself until we got to the parking garage. And when we got to that parking garage and I saw that ding for $30, the enemy said, you are the stupidest person <laughs> in the world. I cannot believe you're down here. Now, how are you going to get out of the garage? Right? And I just had to continue to encourage myself, right? And continue to speak to myself that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of sound mind. I had to continue to remind myself over and over again. 
Then we shoot the first, uh, the first uh, interview, and then the, uh, uh, the producer comes in, and she had flown in from California. The producer comes in, and she says, okay, here's the menu. You all tell me what you're gonna get for, uh, for, for lunch so that we can place these orders, right? Here's the enemy again. Okay, clown, what are you gonna do now for lunch? Because you, now you have to pay for your sound guy. You have to pay for you. Are you gonna say that you're fasting today? <laughs> now what are you gonna do, right? And I got scared. So I handed the uh, menu to my sound man. I said, hey man, pick out what you want to pick out because I did have $5 in my pocket. And I was hoping that he'd just like get a $2 sandwich or something, right? <laughs> so he picked out his. And before he gave it back to me, she came back in and she said, hey, let me get this real quick because, and, and here's, the, uh, here's the cash for lunch. Um, and then you all meet me at the next location my faith just shot up, right? I was like, oh man, let me have a pastrami with this and let me have this and let me, right? I was just going, right? Just going and going. But then we had to go to these different locations. And so I'm thinking, man, we got to take the truck out of one $30 parking area, go to another, right? I started looking at the list and everything was within a two block radius. And we had our car. So we just loaded up the car and I said, man, we're not taking the car out. We're just gonna you know, roll around and, and go. So we ended up, long story short, at Daily Center. We ended up at Daily Center at about four o'clock. By this time, I'm at least about $50 at parking, right? We end up at Daily Center at about four o'clock. The uh, producer says, hey, Randall, can you give me all the tapes? I gotta get on a train to, uh, to, to, uh, um, to get back. She says, by the way, here's your money for your parking. I got to get back, send me the invoice when you have an opportunity. The $5 that I left home with, I returned home with, okay? But it was because I, would, I never would have learned that lesson if I wasn't willing to trust that God was taking me to a new place. After leaving CBS, I would subsequently leave and, 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 and uh, dissolve the business. I would go to seminary and I would become the director of ministries at St. Sabina. Stayed there for 23 years, learning and surrendering to God, right? Left in 2010, still engaged in some television stuff. And then I get a text from a friend of mine that says, hey, LaSalle Street Church is looking for an executive director. I think it's something you need to look into. I was like, LaSalle Street Church, what is that? Who is that? I don't even know anything about LaSalle Street Church, right? But when I came here for the interview, let me show you what happened. A friend of mine, Fletcher Smith, was in law school at Loyola. And he used to live right next door while I was at CBS. He had an apartment right next door. On Fridays, he would ask me to come and pick him up to take him back home and to bring him back because he lived where we, you know, where, where, where we live. I, he, his parents lived where we live. I said, I said, no problem. When I came for the interview and I was circling the place, I recognized that I used to sit right there in that cove waiting for Fletcher to come out. I would sit there for, for months. I mean, not months, literally waiting on him, but <laughs> I, literally I picked him up for months. And I would sit right there in the cold, right there at the park, waiting for him to come out. And when I was circling and I realized that, I sat in the car and just weeped. Because God was showing me all the time that based on your yes, I'm never going to leave you, nor am I going to forsake you. I'm never going to loose my hold from you. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but I've given you a spirit of power, a spirit of love and a spirit of sound mind. And even right now, to know that I'm in a church that's committed not only to having the race conversation, but a church that is committed to doing something tangible about it. Look at what God can do when you say yes and you're willing to endure the cross, despising its shame. All of us have our individual crosses. But when we're willing to say yes, we can lose that life 
and gain a life of purpose. And when you gain a life of purpose, there's absolutely no match for it at all. There's nothing at all that I would change. So the encouragement for the people of God that are under the sound of my voice today is that you should know that we as a staff love you dearly. We as a staff also know that you're being challenged to move from one place to the place that God has called you to be. We also know that several of you have already been in this practice of, in this transition of um, surrender. Uh, uh, our sister Orion has just gone through this, just this process of transition and hasn't blinked an eye. And I know God is meeting her where she's at. And that's the same thing that God wants to do for each and every one of us. But we've got to be willing to free ourselves of the life that we've known and become who God has created us to be. In other words, it's like giving ourselves away. Giving ourselves away to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with the understanding that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from God's love. God is loving us and loving us and loving us and loving us more and more and more despite whatever we've done, despite however we've behaved, despite our toggle with saying yes. God's desire is for us to say yes and to trust him more. <coughs> Excuse me. I was reminded of the song, Oh, for grace to trust you more. So people of God, let's trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Amen? Amen. Amen.